Hello everyone. Today I am going to discuss about the one of the important topic in the surgery, that is a traumatic brain injury. So in this topic, I am going to discuss about the the learning objectives. What is the traumatic brain injury definition? The incidence, risk pop, risk population, causes, mechanisms, and classification of head injury, types of the brain injuries, investigations, and treatments. So these are going to cover in this topic. So first, I'm going to discuss about the, what is the brain injury, traumatic brain injury. If any trauma, any accident, or any injury to the brain, or any skull or scalp in the our head regions, any part is there the outer side is a any is a injury to the skull, that is a uh, if any skull or maybe any skull or any brain injury. So that is also that is called as a head injury. So the injury, these injuries can range from the minor skull crust laceration to the serious brain injury. Lacerations means only breakdown of any skin cut or damage to the skull or until to the is any severe damage to the brain. So these are the different types of the brain injuries or head injuries we can see. So what is the incidence? How often is going to be happen in the head injury? So this head injury is the number of the killers in the trauma. So this is the number one place in the that uh, in the mortality. So because of many people die because of the head injury due to RTA, road traffic accidents. So 4 million people experience head trauma annually according to the WHO statistics. So it mentioned more than 4 million people are experiencing the head trauma annually. So in this one, out of the 4 million, 25% may chance to die because of the severe head injury and severe complications of the brain injury. And also they are going to, in this 4 million, out of 4 million, 50% of the deaths from the motor vehicle accidents. So because so many reasons are there for the head injuries, but who already met with the motor vehicle accidents are any road traffic accidents. So those people are going to die. 50% people are going to die because of the severe complications due to head injury. So who are going to prone to more uh, head injuries? So especially for the males, many is a 15 to 20 years of age groups. So if they ride the fast bike riding or car, so those people are going to prone to get the head injuries. And also males and also females, the percentage, the male percentage going to 50% is more than the female percentage. And infants and also young children also may chance to get. So infants, if anybody fall from the bed or if anybody is free of any object fall on the head also may chance to give the head injury complications. In the elderly, especially who already got more than 70 years of age. So if they having any balance problem and if any, if they having any history of the falls, so because of the balance problem or because of the, their musculoskeletal abnormalities or vision problem, so and also because of the neurological deficits, they may fall down, it may lead to the head injuries. So coming to the, the causes of the head injuries. So head injury causes, so many causes are there for the head injury, but only thing is, is the direct head injury and indirect head injury, and also we have to differentiate uh, separately. In general, head injuries can be divided into two categories based on the cause of them. So is, is due to because of the blowout to the head, if any direct heat to the bed, or is there any secondary complications? So this, and also head injury due to shaking. Because of the any abnormal movement in the head also may chance to give the like a head injury complications. So if you see the uh, head injury due to shaking of the brain, so it's most commonly seen in the children. So this condition is called as shake, uh, shaken baby syndrome. Shaken baby syndrome means if you, while playing the, uh, with the baby, if, uh, the, if you uh, shake the baby like an improper way or in the improper direction, so it may give the damage to the brain, inside the brain. So this is shaking baby syndrome is an infant out of the frustration to make him or her stop crying is not appropriate response. If the baby is crying in those time, if you give the any playing activities, like a shrugging the like a body or maybe a shaking the body. So in the improper manner, so it may give the shaken baby syndrome. So this is going to be the severe shaking can cause the bleeding inside the brain and also other serious injury. So in case of the baby crying time, the baby is uh, uh, unable to stop the cry. So maybe mother or maybe caregivers 
or maybe babysitters. So they are going to do this like a shaking the baby or by lifting the baby. If they shake in proper directions, they may chance to get the bleeding inside the brain. So if the, uh, if the baby get the shaken uh, baby syndrome, so they are going to get the so many complications. So we can understand so why their baby is not feeding properly or if the breathing difficulties. So we have to understand. So what are the abnormalities in the baby? The most common symptoms in the shaken baby syndromes are is going to be having the critical breathing difficulty, poor feeding. So they are going to get the difficult, the breathing is going to be altered or maybe the, they may chance to get the uh, like a dyspnea. And also is because of the, maybe if they, if you see the any poor feeding symptoms, so that means unable to take the feed, they are going to refuse. And also maybe uh, is crying and also vomiting, pale skin, extreme irritability, and also no longer smiles. The baby is not going to respond. And also couldn't hold the head up. So unable to maintain the head in the erect posture. Maybe it cannot control the head. And also may chance to get the convulsions or fits or maybe seizures. So these are the major symptoms of the shaken baby syndrome. That's the reason. So if we have, if we give the awareness to the people, our mother or caregivers, maybe if they prevent the activities such as the lifting the baby above the overhead activities and also uh, shaking activities. So we can pre if we prevent these activities, we can prevent the shaken baby syndrome. So most commonly, if you see in the shaken baby syndromes, so 20% babies are going to get the our baby is a shaken head. So, and also others, 80% are going to get the shaken baby suffering from the long-term effects. So in the 20%, they are going to get the less complications. And also 80% are going to get the severe complications. So these severe complications, they may affect the brain damage, blindness, hearing loss, and spinal cord injury are made, they depends upon the involvement, they may chance to get the paralysis. If it is a neck region injury, they are going to get the like a, uh, they are going to get the paralysis. If it is the brain, the right side affected, they will get the right side hemi or left side hemiplegia, or half of the body is going to get the paralysis. And depends upon the involvement, they may chance to get the speech abnormality and also learning impairment. If they uh, grown up, also may chance to get the so many complications because of shaken baby syndrome. So these are the major cause to factor head injury in the infant. So how to prevent these uh, baby shaken baby syndromes? So when baby won't stop crying, try to put him or her in the cot or play uh, with uh, any pen or something, play pen. So that means we should not uh, lift the baby above the overhead activities and also we should not give the shaking activities. And take him her outside for the walk or ride in a car. So it also, we, they, they are going to stop the crying. And I seek the medical attention in case of if any, if the baby is not uh, stopping the cries or because of any health issues. So immediately we have to consult the doctors. Then only we can, uh, like we can diagnose the problem. Then we can uh, try to avoid the like a, uh, crying uh, in the kids. So in the children, so we can prevent the shaken baby syndrome. So what are the mechanisms of the head injuries? So the main, this uh, is going to be the other causative factors for the head injuries. The other uh, cause factors are the motor vehicle accidents, any road traffic accidents, especially for the bikes and also in the motor, uh, in motor vehicle, uh, like in the cars may chance to give the uh, head injuries. In case nowadays, most of the younger generations, they are not using the proper helmets while riding the motorbike. So if any injury, so it may directly hit to the head, may give the severe complications. So that is the main because of the lack of awareness about the helmet as well as, and also in the ignorance about the helmet also may chance to get the head injury due to motor vehicle accidents. Or in case of any the car accidents, if they are not wearing properly the belt, seat belt, that also may be one of the cause to factor for the head injury. So if they wear the seat belts or is the, the car having the, uh, like a, uh, like a anti-accident, uh, 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 like a cushionings, so it may prevent the head injuries. So in a car, if they're having the like airbags, so if they hit anything to any hard object or maybe accident with the other car, so these airbags are going to be open, may prevent the head injuries. So this is because of the lack of awareness of the seat belt and also helmet. And if the lack of facility in the car, such as like a airbag uh, facilities, so it may use the severe complications. And also other cost factors are falls. So if any object fall on the head, 
so may chance to get the head injury or if the person fall from the any height so in, the, in most of the conditions while constructing the any uh, height of the buildings so may chance to give the head injuries or during the construction if any heavy object fall on the head also may chance to give the the head injury symptoms and also next one is the physical hazards so that means if anybody uh, like uh, during the any uh, physically like in the any violations if they anybody hit on the head with the any iron rod or maybe any hard object used so it may give the head injuries and also in case of sports related accidents in case of especially rugby games the games and also sports or maybe in the running or in case of any like a high jumps and long jumps so this also may chance to get the head injuries especially football and also rugby hockey so this type of games may chance to get the head injuries maybe if the missing the uh, like a height of the jump while jumping or maybe is any twisting activities so or maybe is a, if they missing like while hitting the like a ball or anything may chance to get the injury to the head and also in most cases the skull will protect from our brain to from the serious injuries so if in case of so if we uh, if we control the like what the activities so that means we are going to prevent the uh, like a skull injuries and also head injuries so because of the skull only we are going to get the most of the severe complications if no protective organs such as skull so we may chance to get the severe injuries in many time so that is the main importance and cause to factors of the uh, head injuries so what are the mechanisms so the mechanisms are going to be the blunt injuries and also penetrating injuries the blunt injuries are going to be is a high velocity injuries and also low velocity while driving is because of the motorbike or car so depends upon the speed so if the speed is high so is going to get the high velocity so they may hit the object and also is going to get the severe injuries in they will get the blunt injuries and also is the penetrating injuries penetration means is there because of the gunshot or maybe any sharp objects maybe if they fall on the any heavy object with the iron metal so or maybe any forceful iron metals and also also may chance to get the piercing into the our body so these are the different mechanisms uh, are are going to give the head injuries so other effects are going to be we have to know about the what is acceleration and also what is decelerations acceleration means here for example immobile head is struck by a moving object for example you are standing is somewhere if something is going to be hit if, the, if it is a fast movement if anything hit the head also the head is going to get the that means head is stabilized if a moving object hit there so it's going to get the shake and also this going to get the head injury and also the skull moves away from the force the skull is going to move away from the force so it gives the damage inside the brain so brain rapidly accelerate from the stationary to the motion state causing the cellular damage if anybody sudden hit or with a like a moving object if any if anything hit to the skull it may gives the like accelerations and also because of the acceleration it will give the damage to the brain so that is about the acceleration and also deceleration deceleration means while driving for example if you are moving so the head is moving against and also hit in the in the immobile object so head is moving for example while driving or something so if any if any object is there if suddenly hit so it will get the decelerations so in this condition brain continuous moving in the skull towards the direction of the impact resulting in the significant force that damage the cells so because of the acceleration as well as deceleration both in conditions also the brain is going to get the damage it also gives the cellular damage inside the brain so other type of the mechanisms are going to be and also cope and also counter cope so these are nothing but is resulting from the rapid and also violent movement of the brain so violent movement is because of the so these are going to be the two types is the cope injury and also counter cope injury cope injury means if the because of the any object hit so the injury at the impact site for example injury at the frontal region the effect is going to give in the frontal region so that is the cop injury so because of the injury is here for example frontal regions but if effects to the opposite side so that uh, that mechanism is called as counter cop injury so in case of like in the concussion type of injuries are going to be effect to the opposite side means away from the injury side for example hit is here because of the hit here the effect is going to the opposite side because of the pressure the force 
is going to be effect is going to be the opposite side opposite side so that type of mechanism is called as counter cop injury so if you see the the brain structure our uh, head structure so the what are the anatomical structures if you see so if you understand so the depends upon the involvement of the area the symptoms are going to be different and also injury is going to be different if you see it from the outer to inside outside we have the skull and also next one is going to be skin uh, skull is a meninges so if you see here okay if you okay this is going to be we see outside so this is called as the skull so then one is going to be below the skull so we can see the the skull bone so this is the skull and also here is going to be a skull and skin subcutaneous tissue connective tissue and also gallia and also epineurus so these are the outer covering for outside of the like a skull so is going to be the next one is the bone that is a skull bone if we go inside so just beneath the skull bone we can see the that is the epidura and also dura mater and also pia mater arachnoid mater we can see below the skull so these three parts are called as meninges these are the protecting covering covering layers of the brain and spinal cord also called as meninges so if any injury occurs so depends upon the involvement of the site the uh, the symptoms and also treatment will be vary so if you see this uh, outer side only is the scalp is there so under the scalp is going to be is going uh, skull the skin subcutaneous tissue so if anything damage only is with the minor injuries only scalp is going to be affected with a mild lacerations or injury or breakdown and also any minor cuts so this going to be affected in case of the scalp in case of if the injury to the skull bone so it may depends upon the severity of the force may chance to get the skull fracture so skull fracture also is a depends upon the the fracture type is will be vary is a linear fracture or depression fractures and also basilar fracture so many different type of the fractures are there we are going to discuss there so and also if you go inside the any pressure or violence is increase it may affects to the brain inside the brain so it may give the hematoma or maybe it gives the hemorrhage so this is we just we have to understand what the structures are going to be involved depends upon the involvement of the the structure and also here if you see here the different different layers and different structures are going to involve so because of the the uh, blood vessel damage it may gives the hematoma and also may chance to get the hemorrhage so if you see the morphological classification of the head injuries so these are going to be depends upon which structure is going to be involved so the classification is uh, is will be a skull injury scalp injuries skull fracture and also brain injuries so what we are going to they are going to get in the scalp injuries and skull fractures and also in the brain injuries so we can discuss here so if you see the scalp injury the scalp injuries they are going to get the only laceration or bruising in case of the minor injuries so and also next one is the scalp hematoma so this hematoma may be is the subcutaneous and subgallal and also subperiosteal so these are going to be three types of the hematoma hematoma means nothing but is the is a blood clot in one particular place the accumulation of the blood is going to is called as the hematoma so if you see here in the laceration injuries are going to be minor injuries because of here the scalp is high vascular so in case of injury to the only skull so they may chance to get the bleeding due to because of the laceration so it's not much is a complicated injuries so just only they are going to get the the minor injuries so it will give the bleeding but in case of the heavy bleeding especially in the children they may chance to get the development of the hypovolemic shock so because of the bleeding so heavy bleeding they may chance to get the shock so that is about the laceration injury is a minor injury but in case of uh, if any serious complication of the blood loss and also if the infections because of the wound and lacerations they may chance to get the major complications so it is there those people are going to get the infections because of the cut and also because of the bruising so they may chance to get the infections it may give the further complications so that is about the laceration so coming to the the hematomas so the hematosa is a subcutaneous hematoma so cutaneous means skin so below the skin if anything happens over here so this is going to be the subcutaneous hematoma so the bleeding below the skin so next one is the subgallial so subgallial means the so this is the skin level so this is the epicranial so here is going to get the bleeding in the so this is called as the subglial hematoma so this subgallial hematoma is going to be the below the skin levels is going to get the 
hematoma. And also next one is the subperiosteal. The periosteum is going to be the below the here. So uh, below the periosteum is the below the skull is going to get the, that is called the subperiosteal. So these are the three type of the injuries, head injuries you can find because of the scalp injuries. So next one is the skull fracture. So what are the different type of the skull fractures? So here we have to understand, it depends upon the appearance of the skull fracture. So it is called as, the name you can call as the linear fracture, depressor fractures, a diastatic fractures and basilar fractures. Linear fracture means here is going to be like a linear, like a line, one line structure is going to get the fracture. Depressor means if any hit directly, the part is going to be go inside, becomes the shallow. And also diastasis fractures is mainly affected the suture area, especially in the infants. And also basilar fracture is going to be the base of the skull is going to be affected. So we are going to discuss what type of all the type of skull fractures here. The first one is the linear fracture. So this linear fracture, so break in the continuity of the bone. So that means if you see here, the linear fracture, we are going to see only laser, like we are going to see the one line in the fracture in the uh, skull. So it appears in the uh, thin lines on the x-rays. So if you see here, so it's going to be like a one line we can see here, or maybe we can see is the fracture, the line is going to be can observe here. So these are going to be the, the linear fracture. So full thickness through the bone. So it's going to get the, we can find the, we can, the, how much the thickness we can find in the x-ray. The half little significance, except when it runs uh, thorough. So sometimes it's difficult to find the linear fractures, but this type of conditions, if it's not severe symptoms, so we can, uh, like a management will be, just wait and see the management. That means no complications. You have to wait and see, it's automatically it's going to heal. But in case of other complications, vascular channels, venous sinus screws, iron sutures. So we have, sometimes we cannot find anywhere the fractures. In those conditions, we have to check any vascular channel problem. Our venous sinus screw, our suture areas, we have to observe thoroughly. Then we can easily uh, find out where is the fracture in the linear fracture. And also next one is the depressed skull fracture. So depressed skull fracture is going to be depression. So that means uh, if it is like, if it is a fracture, if the force is happened to the, at one particular side, so the both sides are going to get the fracture. So this is going to go is, a, is away, the, away from the continuity to the, from the skull bone. So the broken piece of the skull bone is pressed towards the, are embedded in the brain. So it's going to towards the brain after the fracture. So here the neurological defeasures are going to be happening and also may chance to get the dural tear. So the, the dura matter is going to get the injury. So it gets a, is a hematoma and also infection in case of the depressed skull fractures. So here you can see the depression. So it's because of the pressure, bone fragments are going to close to the brain. So that is called as the depressive fractures. And also the another fracture is called as the diastatic fractures. So the fractures are going to be happen at the suturing areas. We can see the coronal sutures and also frontal sutures and also occipital sutures. So here is, so if any, the case separations in between the uh, sutures, so it is called as uh, the diastatic fractures. So this most commonly seen in case of the infants, if anybody get injury. So these diastatic fractures, suture lines are traumatic suture separations. So the sutures are going to be separated, most commonly affected newborns and also infants. So because of in those uh, like infants and also newborn babies, these sutures are not fused completely. So they may chance to get the, the suture separations. And also most common is going location is, is a lambdoid and also sagittal suture. So here this part is going to be the lambdoid and also here is going to be in the, the sagittal suture is going to be affected. So it's a more than two separation is that is the SM, uh, SMET. So it's going to be, if any, we are going to call, if it is more than two mm of the suture separation, it is called as the diastasis fracture. So this is the different type of the fractures. So this is, the, and also next one is the basilar fracture. If you see the basilar fractures, so three types of the basilar fractures, we can see the base of the skull. So here is going to be the anterior cranial fossa, anterior one, and also middle cranial fossa. This if you fracture, if anything fracture in the middle is called as the middle cranial fossa fractures, and also posterior canal, uh, posterior cranial fossa. So if any fracture in the these sides, so it depends upon the involvement of the fossa, the cranial fossa. So we called as the the name itself we called as anterior or middle or posterior. So what are the signs and symptoms? 
we are going to find here depends upon the involvement of the anterior cranial fossa or middle cranial fossa or posterior cranial fossa. If you see the anterior cranial or is a anterior skull fractures. So if any fracture in the anterior uh, like a skull fractures in the frontal bone or maybe in the front of the, in the uh, anterior cranial fossa. So these are going to may chance to get the different symptoms. According to the symptoms, we can understand the, the symptom and also where the, the uh, where the not the injury. So here we have to diagnose clinically. So we already having the skull fracture, anterior skull fractures. They are going to get the CSF rhinorrhea. So it's going to be because of the skull fracture. So skull is beneath the skull, meninges is there, that is the dura matter, pia matter, and arachnoid matter. So in between the pia matter and arachnoid matter, the space is called as subarachnoid space. So in this space, cerebrospinal fluid is going to circulate throughout the body, that is in the throughout the central nervous system. So there, if any damage, any skull fracture, any spine injury also may damage, the, if anything damage to the dura mater, so it's going to affect the, the CSF. So it because of the damage of the skull and because of the dura mater, meninges, so they may chance to get the CSF rhinorrhea. That means the CSF is going to leak and also is going to come out from the, comes, uh, from the nose. So if any leak from the CSF from the nose, it is called as CSF rhinorrhea. So if in sometimes the CSF may leak from the ear canal, so that also called CSF otorrhea. That is the two symptoms, two signs we can observe in case of like a skull fractures. If anybody, uh, in, uh, like a, if anybody got the CSF otorrhea, oto means the uh, ear, CSF rhinorrhea, if the CSF comes from the nose. So these signs, uh, importantly, we have to observe while assessing the head injury patients. And also in case of may, may chance to get the epistaxis. Epistaxis means any bleeding from the nose. So they may chance to get the blood as well as may chance to get the CSF. So if it is CSF comes, that is CSF rhinorrhea, the blood comes with the blood rhinorrhea and also is called as the epistaxis. And also may chance to get the subconjunctival hemorrhage. So conjunctiva also is going to get the hemorrhage. And also another important sign in the anterior skull base fractures are going to be the raccoon eye sign. So that means the periorbital surrounding to the orbit is going to get the, like a, uh, is going to get the bleed. So it's a most common sign. If you see the animal of the raccoon, so you can, we can observe here. So the, everything color is different, but the eyes, high spot is going to be color is different. It's a dark color for here. So same like if any ecchymosis or any accumulation of the blood surrounding to the orbit, it is called as the raccoon eye sign. This is the most common sign observed in the who are having the anterior skull fracture or maybe frontal bone fractures. And also who are having this anterior skull fractures. So another symptom is they are going to get the insomnia. So that means there's a loss of smell sensation. So these are the most common uh, uh, signs. So if we observe these signs, so we can easily diagnose the person having the head injury. So in case of in case of the middle skull fractures, so in the middle skull fractures are going to be also the, we can easily identify. So these are especially CSF otorrhea. So middle skull fractures are this going to be the CSF otorrhea. So the CSF comes out from the ear canal. So this is called the CSF otorrhea. And also because of the, this middle uh, like a skull fracture, so it may chance to get the hearing loss. So because of this area is going to be mainly the temporal lobes. So if any damage to the temporal lobe and also may chance to get the hearing loss. Another important sign in case of the middle skull fractures are going to be is the battle sign. So battle sign is nothing but is a hechemosis or hemorrhage and also hematoma occurs behind the ear or also is a mastoid process. So it is called as the battle sign. And also some people may chance to get the facial nerve injury and also vertigo and nystagmus. Vertigo means the reeling sensations. If they sit or stand, they're going to feel the like giddiness. And also nystagmus. Nystagmus is nothing but is the, is the unsteady gaze. Unsteady gaze means they cannot control the, the sight, the vision cannot gaze or uh, see, they cannot uh, observe the object at one place. So they cannot control the eye movements. Eyes are going to be uncontrolled. Nystagmus means uncontrolled rapid eye movements. So that is called as this. So these are the most common signs observed who are having the middle skull fracture. So, and also next one is uh, in case of the posterior skull fractures. So for posterior skull fractures, so they are going to get the, uh, may chance to get the, like a bruising. And this bruising also may chance to get the, like a uh, different signs. 
and especially those people are going to give the cranial nerve injuries. So cranial nerve injuries, the 12 pairs of cranial nerve depends upon the involvement of the cranial nerve, we can see the different uh, symptoms. So for example, if anybody get the injury to the facial nerve, they're going to get the facial nerve palsy. Or in case of, for example, in case of like a uh, trigeminal nerve, they are going to get the trigeminal nerve. So first one is the olfactory nerve, optic nerve, and also oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial now, and also auditory now, hypoglossal now, glossopharyngeal now, and vagus now, and also accessory. So these nerves are going to be, depends upon the uh, involvement, depends upon the now involvement, the symptoms will be bad. And also another important diagnostic procedure in the skull fractures, the double ring sign. So this is the common sign we can observe while checking the CSF analysis. So in the CSF analysis, so if we take the, the CS, if we take, if we collect and also if we analyze the CSF, so the CSF is separated from the blood when it's placed on the filtered paper while assessment. So if we keep the CSF on the filter paper, so automatically is going to separate it from the blood. So this goes is the main like is a sign we can commonly see in case of the like a sp uh, skull fractures. So this also called as the double ring sign, also called as the halo sign. These are the classical signs in the skull fractures. First one is the CSF otoria. Otoria means the CSF come from the ear canal. CSF rhinorrhea, CSF come from the nose. And also raccoonai sign. Raccoonai sign means the, the bleeding around the orbit or ecchymosis around the orbit. And also next one is the battle sign. If any bleeding behind the ear. So these are the major signs and also this is the double ring sign. So these five signs we can commonly observe in case of the skull fractures. So without checking the any other uh, diagnostic procedures such as CT scan and MRI scan also. So if we see these signs, we can easily understand the patient having the, how much severity got the head injury. So this is about the skull fractures. And also other types of the injuries. So we can see the different type of head injuries will give the symptoms. So diffuse injuries and also focal injuries. So what are the diffusion injuries? That is going to be the concussions and also axonal damage are going to be diffuse injuries. Focal injuries are going to be contusions, lacerations, and also epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and also intracerebral hemorrhage. So is going to, these are going to give the severe, like a, the focal signs, focal symptoms we are going to observe. So that is related to completely the neuronal damage. So here, what is the concussion? And also what is the diffuse axonal injury we can discuss here. So concussion is nothing but is a brain injury that occurs when the brain bounces against the heart wall. So if anything hit to the heart wall, the brain is going to be like a bouncing against the heart walls. So they may chance to get the symptoms. So that is the concussions. So generally speaking, the loss of the functions associated with the concussion is a temporary. So concussion is if any hit injury is a frontal, okay, here frontal bone injury hit to the any object. So what happened because of the force, the head is going to get the bounce once. So because of the bounce, the effect is going to be the opposite side. So there is going to get the like a good the injury, but the effect is not at the at the injury side. So because of these things, so they are going to get the loss of consciousness, but it will, it will be temporary. So because of this violence, because of the, this uh, bouncing. So if it is, they are going to get the loss of consciousness. If it is continue, if it is repeated the continuous like a loss of consciousness, so they may chance to get the temporary damage. So the loss of consciousness is going to be temporary, but if it is continuous, if it repeated, so this is going to give the permanent damages. So what are the causes of the these concussions? So it's going to be the stretching of the white matter, sharing or stretching of the white matter fibers at the time of the impact. So it may give the the temporary neuronal damage. So that is about the concussion. And also, so we have to understand about the what is a contusion and concussions. So contusion means going, is going to be affect the severe injury because of the injury side. The side is going to give the hemorrhage and also they're going to get the unconsciousness is more prone than a few seconds, minutes. So that means so more, the prolonged time they're going to get the contusions. So because of the violence force at the, at the injury side. So these are about the, this is a contusion. Contusion is going to be affected the injury side. If the injury at the frontal region, the problem is going to be, and also they're going to affect the frontal region. Concussion means because of the injury at the frontal region, because of the bouncing of the brain, 
so they are going to get the complications so it may stretch the white matters so because of the stretching of the white matter they are going to get the temporary neuronal damage so because of the concussion they are going to get the brief the confusion disorientations maybe if you see any patients after accident or maybe head injury or any like a road traffic accidents few minutes is going to be like a confusion if it is a mild injury of the get up because of the concussion only like a hitting at some place if it is a brain bouncing uh, bounce so they are going to after get up they are going to be confused that means that they are not going to be disoriented that means they cannot speak properly or maybe confusion sometimes they may chance to get the stupor or delirium so unable that's not complete coma or maybe they feel the cloudiness and also next that is the another important the symptom is going to they will feel the headache dizziness that means they are going to feel the giddiness and also like a vertigo symptoms and also amnesia loss of memory so some the few seconds may chance to get the memory loss depends upon the severity of the concussion they may chance to get the uh, like a yeah, like recent memory or remote memory or maybe is going to get the return of the consciousness movement or minutes after the impact so within the 30 minutes they are going to be the normal sometimes depends upon the severity they make uh, like get the recovery within the few minutes within 5 minutes so that is about the concussion but if you see in the brain like in the ct scan and mri scan so there is no effects we can see in the ct scan and mri mri scan so it shows the normal so that is the concussion effects and also after the post concussion syndromes so after the injury if it is not it's not cured properly so it may progress or repeated concussion episodes or loss of consciousness or other other symptoms so it may chance to get so within the until the two months so if the post after concussion if any symptoms occur within the two weeks to two months so it is called as post concussion syndrome so in the post concussion syndromes so if they are going to get the, the complaints will be the persistent headache they are going to get you feel the severe headache and also fatigue tiredness and personality changes personality changes means they are going to get the like a, a depression anxiety or maybe unable to sleep properly insomnia so these type of problems they are going to feel and also short attention span so they are unable to concentrate anything so unable to like a concentrate to do, do any work or to learn also some problem and also decrease the short term memory so they are unable to memorize the short term memory whatever we shows so they may chance to forget and also sleep disturbances so especially is the may, some people may chance to get the like a over sleep or some people are going to get the less sleep or insomnia may chance to get and also depression personality disorders may will get in the may chance to get after the concussion effect within the 2 to 2 months so another effect of the uh, brain injury is going to be is a diffuse axonal injury so the axons are going to be damaged a diffuse axonal injury or shear injury is an injury to the brain that doesn't cause the bleeding but damage the brain cells inside there is no bleeding but may chance to get the the cells damage so because of the this axonal damage is going to give the so sometimes may chance to get the permanent injury and also may chance to get the death also so though it is not an outward visible as others form of the brain injuries so diffuse axonal injury is one of the most dangerous type of the head injuries can lead to the permanent damage and also even death so we cannot see any bleed or anything but the cells are going to get the damage maybe because of the decrease the oxygen supply or that is the which is called is hypoxemia and also any damage inside the cells may give the diffuse axonal damage severe widespread injuries to the axons in the cerebral hemisphere corpus callosum and also brain stem the most of the time they may chance to get the damage in the cerebral hemisphere corpus callosum and also brain stem so because of the injury in the these areas may gives the permanent damage of the axonal axons as well as for because of the permanent damage if it is progress may chance to get the death so in this condition the and diffuse axonal uh, injury so the symptoms are going to be decrease the loss of consciousness so that means immediately they are going to get the loss of consciousness because of the any like a oxygen supply lack of oxygen supply and also hypoxemia and also increasing the intracranial pressures so intracranial pressure is going to be increased because of the pressure because of the, the swelling inside the brain so may chance to get the increase intracranial pressure also going to be increased 
the most common sign in the, in the axonal diffuse axonal in, uh, injury, so they are going to get the decerebrations and also decortications. Decerebration and decortication means, so in the decerebrations, so the posture and also the activity, the, uh, the pattern of the sleeping and also they are the, uh, like a, they're, uh, the status of the body is going to be altered, such as in the decorticate rigidity, decerebrate is going to be, the body is not responding to the, like a, uh, what, the, what we are going to give the stimulus, not the abnormal response we are going to get it. In case of decerebrate rigidity, so if we give any stimulus, the patient position will be in the complete hyperextension of the, all the limbs, upper limbs and also lower limbs. So they are going to be appearance the complete extension of the upper limbs, extension of the lower limbs. So, and also this is the same appearance or posture we can feel, we can find in case of uh, who already having any head injury, any axonal damage. So another type of the uh, posture is going to be decerebrate injury, decorticate injury. Decorticate means upper limbs are going to be the flexion, abnormal flexion contraction. If you give any stimulus, they're going to tighten the upper limbs and also hyperextension of the lower limbs will happen. So this type of postures and abnormality we can find in case of the head injuries. So especially in case of diffuse axonal injury. Along with this diffuse uh, this, uh, abnormal postures, they are going to get the cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairments are, are unable to speak properly and also unable to learn any language. So language efficiency and speech and also IQ. So then also cal calculations and judgment so means all the, that means they're unable to uh, take any decisions. So these problems are going to face you who are having the cognitive impairments. So which means they are going to lose the, all the higher mental functions, higher mental functions such as the orientations and also memory and language, speech, judgment, calculations. And these things are going to be impaired who are already having the external injury. And also another complication, another symptom is uh, spasticity. If any upper motor neural lesions is there in the brain and spinal cord, which is in the, any damage in the central nervous system, so it gives the, the motor, the motor abnormality is called as spasticity. So the muscle tone is going to be increased because of the increased muscle tone, it will give the like abnormality in the posture and also is deformities. So that is called as the upper motor neuron type of the lesions. And also 90% of the patients with a severe diffuse axonal injury will be is a vegetative. So they may chance to get the, not, they won't get any like a, a complete recovery. They may chance to get the other complications and also the, with the cranial, like a cognitive impairments. So it's difficult to get the a recovery who already having the diffuse axonal injuries. But if you check in the CT scan, so it's going to be, the looks like is the normal. There is no abnormality in the brain, but we can found the, these are the uh, complications in cognitive impairments and also the muscular problem as well as the partial problems we are going to form. So that is about the diffuse axonal damage. And also another one, focal involvement, the focal involvement damages are going to be, first one is going to be the hematoma. So this hematoma is nothing but is the blood clot inside the brain, focal side. So is going to be, so this clot in the brain or its surfaces, either inside the brain or in the surfaces, if any bleeding occurs, any blood clot occurs, so that is called as hematoma. So this hematoma may occur anywhere in the, within the brain. So in the inside the brain or in the surface of the brain. So if it is the occurs in the different, so it will be the two types of majorly two types, that is a epidural hematoma and also subdural hematoma. So epidural hematoma means if you see the, the bleeding will be inside the below the dura matter. So sorry, below the so above the dura matter. So here is going to be if you see here, this is the skull and also the dura matter. So if the dura matter, if the bleeding anything occurs between the dura matter and also skull. So this is called as the epidural matter. So it is the collection of the blood between the dura matter and also is a and also inside the skull. So between the skull and also dura matter, if any bleeding occurs, so this is this hematoma is called as the epidura hematoma. So in case of the subdural hematoma, so it's going to be affect the, the bleeding inside the dura matter and also arachnoid matter. So if you see the, the major covering layers, which are called as meninges, if you imagine this is the brain, so above immediately, this is the dark, so this is the first initial layer is called as like a dura, it's a pia matter. The, the first inner layer is called as pia matter. The second layer is called middle layer is called as arachnoid matter. 
outer layer is called the dura mater. So if you see the subdural hematoma means, subdura means below the dura. So below the dura, the hematoma occurs, that's the bleeding occurs. So below the dura and also above the arachnoid matter. So in between the dura and arachnoid matter. So if any bleeding occurs, that is called a subdural hematoma. So the symptoms will be vary according to the involvement of the dura, epidural or subdurals. So we are going to discuss here. So if you see the epidural hematoma, so it's collection between the dura and also skull bone. So most commonly is going to be present in the 75% of the 95% of the course. The cases, so many people, if anybody get the skull fractures, so it's going to happen, the, the skull fracture is going to be happening between 75 to the 95% of the epidural matter. So this hematoma is most commonly, it's a, like a, it, yeah, the sources are going to be the arterial, that is the, and also venous. So it is going to be the any clot inside the brain and also that means epidural, that means the skull and also uh, next up, uh, in case of the uh, skull as well as the epidural, that is above the dura matter is going to give the pressure. So because of the, this dura, it's going to give the more pressure inside the brain. It gives the complications such as the increased intracranial pressure and also severe headache may chance to get in the epidural hematoma. So what is the pathological changes here? The fracture of the temporal bone ruptures the branches of middle meningeal artery. So if epidura, so may chance to give the damage to the temporal bone. So it gives the rupture to the middle meningeal artery. And stripping of the dura matters from the is a calvarium. So it gives the severe headache. So because of the effects of the dura matter, so it's going to give the severe headache. So who are having this epidural hematoma, the main the symptoms are going to be the loss of consciousness and also headache, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. So these are the most common clinical features we can observe in the epidural hematoma. And also the rapid clinical deteriorations. So it's going to be hematoma expansion is going to be, is going to be expand and also elevated intracranial pressure and also brain herniations. So in these conditions, so we can find in the CT scan, we are going to find the, how much the extension is there. And also we can check the intracranial pressure and also brain herniation. In those conditions, immediate surgery is needed. So it depends upon the severity of the herniations. So we, the surgeons are going to decide, is it the craniotomy or maybe is the burr hole technique. So they're going to do the surgical procedure according to the involvement and according to the expansion. So next one is the sub, uh, acute subdural hematoma. So these are going to be the, the blood is going to be hematoma occurs between the dura matter and also erected matter. So these are going to be <coughs> disturbed to the cortical vessels are going to be involved and also brain laceration produce the hematoma. Sometimes the brain lacerations also give the bleeding. So because of this bleeding, you will give the hematoma. So these are going to be the signs and symptoms are going to be happening within the 40 years of the injury. So that is the important. Sometimes after the injury, the people may won't get any symptoms. So uh, that's the reasons immediately we should not uh, like ship the patient. So we have to uh, keep the patient in the ICU and we have to observe the signs and symptoms. If the signs and symptoms progress means, so we have to go for the further evaluation and treatment plan. Otherwise, if the symptoms are not progressing, if the mild injury, so we no need to give any treatment. So only for the pain management and only for the headache, so we can treat according to the symptoms. So other factors are going to be uh, associated with uh, major trauma. So there may chance to get the shearing forces. So in this type of fractures and also in the hematoma, the mortality rate as high as 40% in some series. So they're going to get at least 40%. They may chance to get in case of subdural hematoma. If not resolved properly, if there is no proper treatment. So they may chance to get the 40% the of the people because of the acute subdural hematoma. So if you see the CT scan, so we can found the so the hyperdenser, the subacute, uh, like subdural hematoma, and also is going to be the concave appearance. So it's going to be the spreading across the brain. It's also going to spread from one place to another place. And because of the herniation of the brain and because of the shifting, so midline shift also is appropriate to the size of the lesion. So it depends upon the site of the lesions. So if the herniation, it may chance to get the, the midline shift in the. So if you see the normal one, so the midline, the midline should be the straight. So because of the, this is a expansion of the hematoma is going to be pushed this brain tissue. So it may chance to get the like a um, uh, midline shift. 
So with the finding of the midline shift, so we can understand where they're having the hematoma and the, how much the severity of the hematoma. Next one is the chronic subdural hematoma. So this chronic subdural hematoma is elderly and anticoagulant and also antiplatelets. So, and also it may chance to get in case of the elderly because of the anticoagulant therapy or is the antiplatelets. So history is a minor head injury in weeks or months prior to the presentations. So if anybody get any like a, not in the like a sudden one, so it's going to be chronic. If they met with an accident one or two months back also, may slowly, slowly is progress. The hematoma is going to progress. It gives the chronic subdural hematoma. It may give the symptoms uh, because of the, the hematoma grows. Small bridging vein stairs are because of the small or the clinically silent hematoma are increasing the sign and also mass effect. So if it is the damage and happened to the small like a vein tear, so it may give the, the, the small hematoma. If the hematoma progress, if the increasing size, so it may give the mass effect, the gross increasing the size means it going to the like a space occupying, the hematoma occupy the space in the brain because of the space occupying, the hematoma push the brain structure to the opposite side. So it's going to give the pressure inside the brain and also it gives the headache as well as cognitive impairment. And also they are going to get the neurological deficiencies and also will get the seizures are also called as epilepsy or the uh, fits. So these are the most common symptoms in case of the chronic epidural subdural hemorrhage. <clears throat> So if we see in the chronic subdural hematoma, so we can found here the out below the, the dura matters, so we can found it. So next one is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid means the arachnoid between the uh, between the arachnoid matter and pia matter. The first one, if you imagine, this is the skull. So below the skull covering layer is the dura matter. Below the dura is going to be arachnoid matter. Below the arachnoid matter is going to the pia matter. This pia matter is going to give the very close to the brain tissues. So between the PR matter and the arachnoid matter, this space is called as the arachnoid space, subarachnoid space. So if any hemorrhage between the arachnoid matter and between the PR matter, so in this space, so the space, the, the hemorrhage is called as arachnoid hem subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it is going to be caused by the bleeding into the subarachnoid space, the space between the arachnoid matter and PR matter. So if any bleeding occurs, that is called as subarachnoid hemorrhage. It appears as diffuse bleds and also spread thinly over the surface of the brain and commonly after the, the traumatic brain injury. Most cases of the subarachnoid hemorrhage associated with the head trauma are mild. So if anybody he met with an accident or any injury, so there it will be the, give the subarachnoid hemorrhage, but is are also going to be the mild. And also they may chance to get the hydrocephalus may result from the severe traumatic sub, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus means accumulation of the CSF in the brain, in uh, ventricles as well as in the brain tissue. So it may use the like a hemorrhage in, in the subarachnoid space. So this also one of the cause two factors for the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So trauma is the most cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the trauma will be in the subarachnoid vessels, small subarachnoid vessels are followed by the aneurysms. So compression of the uh, vessels or is an injury to the vessels. And also uh, it may chance to get the aneurysms. Aneurysm means is abnormal dilatation of the blood vessels. The blood vessel become the dilatation, is a bigger size. The blood vessels are having the, like a, the, the smooth wall structures and also it has the layers. That is three layers, tunica media, sorry, tunica intima is the inner layer, tunica media is the middle layer, tunica advantageous is the outer layer. So if any like a, like a contraction and relaxation, so if because of the, any abnormality in the blood vessels is going to be expand, is going to be enlarged, so if it lost the elasticity of the fibers, elastic fiber responsibility in the blood vessels, so unable to like relax and contract. So what happened? The blood vessel is going to be enlarged or dilate. So if the pressure is more, this enlarged blood vessel is made chance to get the burst. So it made chance to get the, the breakdown. So because of this breakdown, the bleeding may chance to get, especially in the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that is called as aneurysms. So this is going to be the rarely aneurysm hemorrhage immediately the precedes the trauma. So may chance very rare conditions only after the uh, trauma, the breakdown of the blood vessels may chance to get. So most can be managed conservatively. So if any get the subarachnoid hemorrhage, so if we give the medication, proper medications, 
or we can control is a, a managed with conservatively if it's not controlled properly so only have to do the surgical procedures to clear the hemorrhage next one is the cerebral contusions so just these are like a is a cope and counter cope injuries the cope injuries means if injury at the injury site for example if anything damage to the injury site if hit at the frontal region the effect is going to the frontal region the counter cope is going to the hit at the frontal region the effect is going to be the opposite side in the occipital region or in the midbrain or is going to give the the counter cope injuries so most commonly affecting in the inferior frontal fossa and also temporal fossa so is going to be the inferior frontal fossa so is going to be inferior as well as the temporal uh, lobes so if it's temporal lobes if you hit here so what happen is going to be affect to the opposite side so this is common uh, like a, uh, uh, places are going to be found in the inferior frontal fossa and also temporal fossa lobes if you see in the ct scan the ct scan is appears in the heterogeneous with the mixed areas of the high and low densities so it's not going to be a clear picture is going to be the heterogeneous going to be mixed areas with the high end low density the density is going to be the sometimes high is going to be the mixed with the high and low densities we are going to found in case of uh, counter cope uh, injuries and also observations are so rarely required and also immediately uh, surgery so sometimes because of these things so uh, observation is they are going to identify sometimes it won't give much the symptoms so we have to observe and also until the symptoms have to wait and also in case of if the very rarely they may chance to get the surgical procedures because of if we observe we can identify the what are the complication they are going to get in the because of the contusion and counter cope conditions next one is the intracerebral hematomas intracerebral hematomas inside the brain so is the inter intraparenchymal are intraventricular so these are going to be two types so this intraparenchymal means inside the if you see the here so this is the we can see the with the ventricles so these are the fluid filled cavities so is there may be intracavicular hemorrhage or maybe the intraparenchymal that means in the tissue brain tissue is going to be affected so these are the two types so these are going to be the ventricles if any damage or any injury in the ventricle any hemorrhage in the ventricles we called as intraventricular hemorrhage so what are the causes for the intracerebral hematoma and also hemorrhage so most common these are things are going to be trauma head injury and also in case of hypertension in case of hypertension the pressure is going to be increased or may chance to get the bleed in the blood vessels because of the aneurysms uh, and also ruptured avm arterio venous malformation and also coagulopathies any blood disorders so because of these cause the causative factors these causative factors are going to give the the bleeding inside the brain such as in the the parenchymal region as well as the ventricular regions so these are the two types of the hemorrhage so what are the clinical symptoms in the ventricular hemorrhage so and also is the parenchymal hemorrhage and also the progress to severe headache so is going to get the severe headache because of the increased intracranial pressure if any bleed occurs the space is going to be occupied to the in the brain as well as going to give the pressure inside the brain because of the in, in this uh, the bleeding and also the tissue damage is going to give the inflammation because of the inflammation the brain is going to get the swelling so along with the nausea and vomiting sensations if anybody with any injuries related to the brain the most common signs and symptoms are going to be headache nausea and vomiting and also giddiness they are going to getting giddiness and also focal neurological deficiencies focal neurological deficiencies means they are going to get the movement disorder movement deficiencies and also sensory deficiencies and also next about the they are going to get the all the like a, a higher mental functions loss the speech and also language calculation judgment so these symptoms are they are going to get and also decrease the level of consciousness the level consciousness is going to be decreased so and also brain herniations so if it depends upon the severity of the hemorrhage so hemorrhage is going to get the brain herniations if the brain herniation they are going to get the midline shift in the ct scan we can clearly observe in the ct scan so this uh, level of consciousness we can assess with the glasgow coma scale so we can understand how much the severity of the coma is there we can identify according to glasgow coma scale so that's about the uh, clinical presentations and also different types of the like uh, brain injuries axonal diffusion injuries and also cope and counter cope and and also concussion so these are the different types and also clear what are the cause to factors and also in risk uh, incidence and risk factors we are discussed so in the next class 
we are going to discuss about the what are the investigation procedures of the head injuries or the traumatic brain injuries what is the management how is the medical management how is the surgical management how is the like a remaining the rehabilitation management i'm going to discuss in the next class hope you understand clearly about the brain injury if you have any doubt in the brain injuries can you send me the message so i can clarify your doubts so that's all about today's topic thank you very much see you in the next class